Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this week's virtual journal club. And uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Juan Pablo Brito. I am endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic and co-host of these virtual sessions. And this morning we have the honor to introduce two fantastic speakers. Dr. Joanna Simone Spirreira uh, is our main speaker, uh, presenting her research about outcomes of thyrotropin alpha versus levothyroxine withdrawal aided radioactive iron therapy for distant metastatic. Uh, popular thyroid cancer and our discussant today, Dr. Stephanie Fish. So I will start with introduction for both of our speakers at front. So Dr. Joan Simons Pereira is a graduate of medicine in Columbia University in Portugal and completed her residency in endocrinology at Instituto Portugues de Oncología in Lisboa, where she's currently practicing as an endocrinologist and researcher. She is also an endocrinology professor at Nova Medical School in Lisboa and her main clinical work and research are in the field of endocrine oncology, especially thyroid and adrenal cancers, and endocrine conditions of cancer survivors. Uh, she recently defended her PhD thesis in aggressive thyroid cancer. Dr. Stephanie Fish is a board certified endocrinologist. She's an associate member of, in the endocrinology division of the Memorial Sloan Catherine Cancer Center, an associate clinical professor of medicine at Wild Cornell School of Medicine. She is a clinician who focuses on the care of patients with thyroid disease, specifically thyroid cancer. She's also the Associate Pro Program Director of the Combined Endocrine Fellowship Program and Memorial Slow Cancer Center and the Well Cornell School of Medicine. Dr. Fish is an active member of the Endocrine Society and the American Thyroid Association. She was the original co-director of the Fellows Program during the annual Med American Thyroid Association meeting in 2005 and continued to serve in the role for 10 years. In 2016, she was the clinical chair of the program committee for the annual ATA meeting, and she also taught innumerable thyroid ultrasound courses to endocrinologists and fellows across the country. With that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Simone Spirreira, and thank you very much for, for your time with us. Thank you, Dr. Brito. First of all, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Brito for the invitation and this opportunity. Um, it is with great pleasure that I'm here presenting our research and this paper. As you all may know, distant metastases occur in a minority of well-differentiated thyroid cancer, but they represent the main cause of death. After total thyroidectomy, radiodine therapy remains the first-line therapy for the metastatic patients. However, there are still some unsolved questions regarding this therapy. As you may know, for the success of radiodine therapy treatment, that is the influx of radiodine into the follicular cells and the rotation of radiodine um, uh, therapy, the PSH must rise. This raise historically has been obtained uh, by levothyroxine withdrawal. Um, the thyroxine withdrawal can lead to severe symptoms of hypothyroidism that may be significant and disabling, especially in metastatic patients. So, thyrotropin alpha was developed to aid the radiodine therapy in, without the need for stopping levothyroxine treatment. However, thyrotropin um, alpha is not currently approved for the preparation of radiodine therapy in the metastatic context. It's only approved in the remnant and in the adjuvant setting, mainly because there is a lack of robust data comparing the two methods of preparation in terms of metastatic disease. So, we wanted to compare the two methods of radiodine therapy preparation in terms of avidity and clinical response, structural and biochemical. And we also wanted to evaluate whether the two methods of radiodine therapy preparation represented independent prognostic factors of progression free survival and disease specific survival. We perform a retrospective analysis of all papillary thyroid cancer patients submitted to radiodine therapy uh, due to distant metastatic disease between 2006 and 2018. 
patients were included whether the distant metastases were diagnosed at PTC diagnosis or during follow-up. We excluded other types of differentiated thyroid cancer. We also excluded patients that had been submitted to radiodyne therapy by both levothyroxinidrol and thyrotropin, and we also excluded those patients without an adequate, adequate rise in TSH. These protocols may be similar in all centers, but um, we generally instruct the patients to follow a low iodine diet and to avoid iodine containing solids two weeks in the two weeks before the radiodyne therapy administration. In the levothyroxine withdrawal group, we ask patients to stop levothyroxine at least six weeks before the radiodyne therapy administration. Then they receive liothyrodine that is stopped at least two weeks before the radiodyne therapy administration. In the patients that maintain levothyroxine treatment, um, they receive in the two consecutive days before the radiodyne therapy administration an intramuscular injection of pyrotropin. In both cases, patients remain hospitalized for two days, and in the last day, the, the day of the clinical discharge, they are submitted to a, a whole body scintigraphy. As clinical outcomes, we wanted to evaluate avidity in the whole body scintigraphy performed after the radiodyne therapy. We also wanted to evaluate um, the progression of disease, either structural, structural um, evaluating the receipt criteria or biochemical, and also progression to survival and disease specific survival. So, we included 95 PTC patients with distant metastatic disease. 27 were submitted to radiodyne therapy after levothyroxine withdrawal and 68 after thyrotropin injection. The main characteristics of the cohort were similarly, similar regarding clinical and pathological features like gender, surgical approach, PTC variants, but the median follow-up follow-up time since PTC diagnosis was superior in the levothyroxine withdrawal group and the median age at PTC diagnosis was superior in the thyrotropin group. However, the median age at first radiodyne therapy with metastatic disease was similar between the two groups. Um, the proportion uh, of macrometastases and distant metastatic size sites were also similar between the two groups, and the median total radiodyne activity was identical in the two groups also. When we evaluate one of our main outcomes, that is avidity, we did not observe any differences between the group, the groups. However, Stimulated thyroglobulin at first radiodyne therapy was superior in the thyrotropin group, probably indicating a higher burden of disease. When analyzing the structural response, we observed that we, uh, the, the two groups were similar. The proportion of complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progression of disease were similar between the two groups. And when analyzing the structural or biochemical progression, they were also similar between the two groups. Regarding uh, other two outcomes, that is progression-free survival and disease-specific survival, we also did not observe any difference between the two groups. Regarding the radiodyne-associated side effects, the proportion of cyanogenitis was similar between the two groups, and we also wanted to evaluate the complete blood count before the radiodyne and at last follow-up. We observed that in the levothyroxine withdrawal cohort, 
median levels of hemoglobin, leukocytes, and platelets were significantly different between the baseline and at last follow up. And in the thyrotropin group, only median platelet levels were significantly different. However, in both groups, the median levels of these parameters remained in the, the reference value, the reference range of values. We could not exclude that some factors set, such as infection or the progression of disease itself could, could not influence these uh, results. So here I'm, we present one of the largest studies comparing the clinical outcomes of thyrotropin versus levothyroxine withdrawal mediated um, radiodyne therapy in the context of metastatic um, carcinoma. We did not observe any difference in terms of avidity and clinical response, and we did not uh, observe any differences in terms of progression-free survival and disease-specific survival. There are obviously some limitations in this, in this study. Mainly, they are due to the retrospective design of this um, work. Also, the cohort of levothyroxine withdrawal patients was smaller than the thyrotropin one and had a longer follow-up. However, we were able to study a homogeneous cohort of patients. We studied only PTC patients, and our population was larger than the majority of the populations reported in our studies. And as it was a single center study, patients were submitted to similar protocols. Concluding, in addition to its role in remnant ablation and adjuvant therapy, we consider that thyrotropin may be an alternative method for preparation of, for radiodyne therapy in the metastatic context, in distant metastatic context. Um, thyrotropin mediated radiodyne therapy presents a similar clinical outcomes to levothyroxine withdrawal. And thyrotropin may avoid a prolonged hypothyroid state, which may aggravate the physical and psychic conditions, especially in metastatic patients. And this, at least, um, may avoid um, theoretically uh, the stimulation of tumor growth. So, thank you for your attention. And once more, thank you for the invitation and for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Samois Pereira. That was an excellent um, summary of the paper and the study and, and um, a great, great work that you put together um, from your institution. And um, I'm going to just talk a little bit this morning about some Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can yeah. see it. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Simois Pereira. That was um, an excellent summary um, of the study and the paper and um, the great work that you got that you put together at your institution with um, the treatment of this um, rare group of thyroid cancer patients, those yeah. with this very advanced disease. Um, Okay, can you hear me again? I don't know why I, some, something I'm hitting keeps muting me. Um, I will try to keep an eye on that. No, 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 yes, now we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I must keep pushing something that's muting me. Um, but so I wanted to just sort of start and sort of give a little bit of perspective of sort of what this group of patients is that we're looking at. Um, and these are the patients with papillary with distant metastatic disease. Um, 
And, and this is a small group of patients. So in, in, in at presentation, less than 10% of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer will present with distant metastatic disease. In this study, it was maybe a little bit of a larger group because it was those who had distant mets at presentation, as well as those who may have developed distant mets during um, monitoring and surveillance. Um, and the thing that's important to recognize is you know, while we generally think of dif well differentiated thyroid cancer as having a very good prognosis and great long term survival, this is the small group of patients who don't have as good um, of an overall prognosis. And, and developing distant metastatic disease is associated with increased in mortality, with five year survival of only 30 to 40 percent, especially in our older patients. Um, and one thing that is important to recognize is that um, this overall survival does depend on um, the location of the distant metastatic disease, where studies have shown that survival is better in those with pulmonary metastases and not as good in those patients who have um, extra pulmonary metastases. So that um, 10 year survival in those with just pulmonary metastases is about 63% and drops to about 25% 10 year survival when you have um, bone mets and more distant mets outside of the lungs. And so if we look about in the data from your study overall in the, in the groups, about 70% of those patients with distant metastatic disease, the disease was pulmonary metastases alone. So the majority are in that group with maybe a little bit of an improved overall survivor, and then about, um, and then 30% with maybe pulmonary and bone or some other site of disease. So just to kind of think about sort of the population that you had that you were studying. And then I think the other thing that I wanted to sort of mention, if we look in this overall population, you had about, 30% um, mortality from thyroid cancer, similar in both groups um, at the time of overall follow-up. Um, the median follow-up was just over six years, so we didn't even have the full like 10, 10 years, but in, you know, this is, again, I this these are the most advanced cancers. These are the sickest patients with thyroid cancer, and these are the patients that really can, will, can and will die from thyroid cancer, and that was reflected overall in your population with this 30% mortality rate. And so then we think about, you know, what is the role of radioactive iodine in the treatment of these patients and how effective is it? And I think then that's where you have to think about, especially in younger patients with metastatic disease, survival and prognosis is actually quite good. And so that in those patients younger than 55 years with distant metastatic disease, they still fall into AJCC um, stage two um, with um, over 90% long-term survival and, and very good. And these, these are the patients that really do maintain iodine avidity, um, respond well to radioactive iodine, and it's a, a very important and effective um, part of the treatment. And um, and so that's where, again, I want to think about your study. That average age was about 64 years. Patients did range from as young as about 20 to in their 80s or so. So there was a wide range with a median around 64. So, which means we're really pushing more towards an older population, um, a population that may be less likely to be um, sensitive to the radioactive iodine. Um, likely to have a little bit of a worse prognosis overall from their disease. Um, and so I think also, again, just to kind of put that into perspective, we it's still the right treatment to do. We're still gonna use radioactive iodine, but again, how we do the radioactive iodine, we kind of wanna do it with the least other side effects or other problems because it's not clear that it's gonna be the most effective treatment in this population. So again, I think that pushes us more towards this idea of utilizing more of the recombinant human TSH and, and less of that thyroid hormone withdrawal, which I think is where, that's where I'm kind of going with all of this. 
Um, and then the other thing that I thought was interesting in your data, um, when we you had some data on the complete remissions, which was a very small percentage, somewhere between the two groups, six to 11% of patients went into complete remission after these radioactive iodine treatments. The one thing I was curious is if that was more of a younger population. I don't know, do you know that? Oh, you're muted now. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it was the, the younger population that, yeah. that showed the complete response. Of yeah, course, that's what I figured. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's where, you know, so that I think, and I, you know, that's these patients um, are different and how they're going to respond is different and how we're going to treat them may be a little bit different. But when we have a young person with lung mets, the radioactive iodine can really be very effective lead to a complete response and overall excellent long-term survival, that's a lot less likely in our older population. And so just mm -hmm. something that we wanna keep in mind when we think about these groups. Um, and then this was just, this is a slide um, from Dr. Tuttle, but this idea, and this, this again, this idea that people respond to radioactive iodine differently. And in those patients who are radioactive iodine responsive, you know, they can end up having a very normal lifespan after treatments, maybe more than one treatment, but really very, very good prognosis. But the hard part is these other group of patients, those who be, who are radioactive refractory, even from initial diagnosis or maybe over time. And these are the patients that, that can, do end up dying from thyroid cancer and the radioactive iodine, you know, we need to the whole key here is we need to find better ways to treat these patients because the radioactive iodine itself is not, mm -hmm. yeah, is not really working. But so that's where I think um, is important to kind of keep in mind. Oh, and I just, oh. am I there? Y yes, we can see your slides. Uh, right now oh, is okay. the radioactive. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like I'm better with my mouse than, and I keep going to my um, screen. And so, um, so that's so it's kind of now sort of the next kind of bringing us to the paper and this idea of looking at thyroid hormone withdrawal versus um, recombinant human TSH. Um, and it's interesting that recombinant human TSH is not approved in the US, the FDA, in the European society that does these, these approvals. And I think a lot of it may just be this is a small small group of patients. It's almost impossible to really do perspective studies and get this data perspectively. And I think they just, they don't have the data to approve it. And yet, you know, you presented in your paper, including your paper, there were nine studies where recombinant human TSH was utilized in the treat in the radioactive iodine treatment of patients with distant metastatic disease. And um, and I think what your study shows, the fact that the thyroid hormone withdrawal were these patients who had these really long follow-up because your, your study started in 2006 when recombinant okay. human TSH wasn't even available. So the early patients were the ones going through thyroid hormone withdrawal. Yeah, and I would exactly. assume that the more recent patients, the patients that you've been treating more recently that you're using recombinant human TSH in the treatment. And I think, the study indicates and your study indicates and what we, you know, is that this actually, you know, I think has become the norm in a lot of ways, even though it's, I guess, theoretically being done as an off-label treatment. Um, but I think, you know, the feeling is, again, these are sick patients. Um, it's much easier tolerated to do the treatments with recombinant human TSH. There's, there theoretically would be less side effects. You showed some maybe improvement in bone marrow, um, parameters with recombinant human TSH, not really differences in sialodenitis, but I think um, certainly from a quality of life standpoint, um, much better in doing treatments with recombinant human TSH as opposed to thyroid hormone withdrawal. And I feel like, you know, I think a lot of people are doing it this way. Um, it's not approved at this point. And I think then it becomes an issue, at least in the US of insurance is covering it. Um, recombinant human TSH can be quite expensive. Um, and if you're doing it in the setting where it's not in an, F, in an approved way, that there's the theoretic, theoretically insurance companies could choose not to not to um, cover the medication in that setting. I'm not sure if that's as much an, if that is an issue in Portugal with more socialized medicine and if 
no, it's not really an issue because we are a public hospital and we the, the money comes from the state, not from the insurance yeah. companies. So it's a little bit different. We have certain of a, more freedom to choose, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have some cost limitations, and in Portugal, that is a real problem. But uh, um, the studies they show that when when analyzing the cost of hypothyroidism, the absenteeism um, in work, um, recombinant TSH it's it's um, it's not more expensive than levothyroxine withdrawal. So I think right. uh, that yeah. we should consider that. Yeah, absolutely, and I agree because that's you know. There's other, there's outside costs besides just the cost of the medication in the cost yeah. of patients being unwell and sick. And so I agree. And I think, you know, I just think it's interesting. I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of people who treat a lot of thyroid cancer do treat their distant metastatic disease with recombinant human TSH, even though right now it's not, it's, it's not um, officially approved for that approved, indication. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's it. yeah. So I was you know that this idea of sort of balancing those risks and benefits is important. And I think um, understanding sort of what the long term outcome is in these in these patient population, and then sort of minimizing the risks, minimizing um, effects on quality of life during when you're thinking about your treatments. And so and then you know I kind of so that I want to be sort of also come back to this idea that you know. In this group of patients, you know, yes, we want to do aggressive surgery, we want to do radioactive iodine, we keep their TSH suppressed, and and these are all things that are important in the treatments. But even with all the standard treatments, these are patients who can, who will, many will die of their thyroid cancer, and so we have to kind of shift our goals and sort of think about where, what are what are our goals in addressing these patients and treating these patients and our goals may not be um, cure, but we want to improve survival. We want to relieve symptoms. We want to minimize any effects on the patient. We want to decrease the morbidity from the disease, minimize pain, um, minimize limitations and shortness of breath, cough, things like that, and and um, and then also minimize morbidity from the treatment. So, so we want to kind of, while we can't necessarily cure these patients, we want to do treatments that are going to improve their um, their overall survival and then also um, minimize any effects from the treatment. So I think, again, that's further support of this idea of using the recombinant human TSH when we're doing our radioactive iodine treatment. And then sort of one of my sort of my, one of my last points is this idea that when you do have patients like this, that um, you have to think outside the box. Sometimes you really need a multidisciplinary approach. You need centers that have excellent surgeons that have excellent endocrinologists, excellent nuclear medicine departments, radiology, um, radiation oncology, and also interventional radiology. And I just kind of put out there, you know, beyond the radioactive iodine, there's lots of other options for treatments in these patients. Sometimes um, localized treatment surgery for sort of localized disease, radiation for bone disease, then sort of chemoembolization or radiofrequency ablation and liver metastases and things like that. Um, and so, and then beyond that, sort of now we have these TKIs that are approved and this idea of redifferentiation therapy so that we have this much larger armamentarium to address these patients, certainly compared to sort of in your study starting in 2006, what was available in 2006 for these patients was very, very limited. And as we get now to 2021, we have lots of other options. And so while radioactive iodine remains a big a mainstay of our treatment, there's lots of other parts to it. And so we need to kind of be thinking about that. And I wanted to kind of just talk for a second about this idea of redifferentiation therapy, because this is a kind of a combination of using these newer technologies, using what we know about the molecular background of the tumors to give radioactive iodine. And, you know, I'm just, you know, so, you know, mostly focusing on, you know, the MAP kinase pathway, um, and which is activated in thyroid cancer patients with that activation leading to a decrease in sodium iodine symporters and with um, 
different inhibitors and blocking this MAP kinase pathway, we can then allow tumors to start to produce the sodium iodine symporter again and allow them to allow tumors that were not responding to radioactive iodine to now start to respond to radioactive iodine. And, um, you know, this was just, this was the first study. I mean, this was done at Memorial, which is why I'm pre presenting it. But this was the solumetinib study, which was one of, was the first redifferentiation study and really found that using I124 PET, lesional dosimetry, and the MEK inhibitor in at least a subset of patients with um, distant metastatic disease, we can allow these tumors to become responsive to radioactive iodine again. And pulmonary metastases that really weren't taking up radioactive iodine can become radioactive iodine sensitive and allow us to give these larger doses of radioactive iodine. And from this study now in the years, more and more redifferentiation re studies have been done and are developed and sort of much more focused on the specific molecular characteristics of the study to kind of focus your inhibitor to try to get the most response from the radioactive iodine. And sort of the big point I wanted to make is that every single one of these ray differentiation trials has used recombinant human TSH in mm -hmm. the protocols to then give the radioactive iodine. And so I just, you know, it just really struck me as I was thinking about your study and thinking about this whole concept that, that recombinant human TSH isn't even officially approved in this setting, that all of the redifferentiation studies, which are all being done on only patients with distant metastatic disease, are using recombinant human TSHs in, in their protocol, are having you know, good you know, effectiveness and treatment of these very advanced patients, and then also sort of minimizing the side effects and symptoms relating to the treatment. And I feel like this is even further data in support of this idea that, that recombinant human TSH is probably the, the most appropriate way to prepare um, patients for mm -hmm. treatment in the setting of distant metastatic disease and the setting where there, these are the patients who are actually really sick from thyroid cancer and putting them through thyroid hormone withdrawal just has so many potential side effects of quality of life, but also potentially swelling of the tumor, other types of symptomatic things that I feel like um, it kind of, again, goes, a, goes along with this idea that your data supports and that all these, that there, there have been other studies to support, but unfortunately, all somewhat in a retrospective way, which I think is part of why it's harder to maybe get that approval, but I think um, goes along with the fact that, that, that it's certainly safe and effective to use recombinant human TSH um, in this patient population. And with that, I will stop and open this to um, anyone who has any questions. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Jenna, for those wonderful uh, presentations. We do have um, a few questions from the audience. Um, let me just uh, read the first question here. Um, it's from Dr. Monica Roslick. Uh, ask, how did you determine the ability, and this is of course for Joanna, how did you determine the activity uh, of the uptake of the two groups? Was this some, some visually, or do you use any uptake calculation? just visual we visual. reviewed visual yeah we reviewed uh, reviewed all, all the scans with the nuclear medicine specialist and but it was just visual um evaluation okay uh, thank you john um dr mark urkin asks uh, what do you think uh, that we are missing in trying to understand the difference in response to radioactive iodine between younger and all the patients who have systemic metastatic disease. And uh, Stephanie, you can help us with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think that likely, you know, if we looked from a molecular standpoint that the tumors may be different, I think, um, you know, that in general, this, I, this activation of the MAP kinase pathway happens less in the younger patients. They maintain that sodium iodine symporter and respond to the radioactive iodine very well. I would imagine if molecularly the tumors may have slightly different um, appearance as well. And I just think as the patients get older, the behavior, the types of tumor cells that do, that spread, that go to the bones, that go to the lungs are those that um, 
are those that didn't respond to the initial treatments and probably were, you know, didn't respond to initial doses of radioactive iodine. And so it sort of selects for these more um, refractory tumor cells that likely from a molecular level are um, have lost this importer. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's uh, yeah, awesome. And then um, uh, one question, John, and you mentioned that one of the strengths of your paper was that you only included patients with papillary type cancers. Uh, why, why was, well, how did it, was the decision made to exclude patients with follicular cancers? Because, as we observed in our in other in another study that we performed, uh, follicular thyroid cancers and papillary thyroid cancers may be different in terms mm -hmm. of avidity and response to radiation therapy. So we wanted to study a homogeneous cohort of patients because sometimes, and even if we include, for example, earth of cell carcinomas that were previously uh, included in the FTC subtype, um, they are also they have also different responses to radiation therapy, and their avidity is also different. So we wanted um, to study. It's it's impossible to study a perfect homogeneous population, of course, but we we didn't want to, a bias from the 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 histology regarding avidity and the, the response to radiation therapy. That's why you wanted only patients with papillary type cancer. I, I see. So the decision was mostly to keep um, a very clear um, group of patients, but it was not because you were particularly concerned about using recombinant uh, uh, TSH on, on follicular versus PTC. Is that correct? It was mostly... No, because, yeah. no, 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 no. It was only because we wanted to, to, uh, uh, a cohort of, uh, that were, was homogeneous in terms of ability and uh, response to radiation therapy. Uh, no concerns about giving paratropin uh, to follicular thyroid cancer or to earth cell cancers. No. I see. No, yeah, thank you for that. And um, uh, one of the concerns we use with recombinant TSH has been some of the changes in size of metastatic um, disease, particularly with swelling of some of those, that if this uh, swelling were to happen in the spinal cord or in the brain or in the superior vena cava region might cause uh, significant harm to patients. So um, the question, even from uh, the audience, is: uh, Did you see uh, there was any patients that had these um, metastatic disease locations that you know we always are concerned about that, like a brain or spinal? Yes, some of them. Yes, okay. Um, some of them, the clinical who was following that patient decided or not to put the patient on corticoids, on glucocorticoids, because that is recommended. Um, but yes, there, there were some patients with that uh, struggling locations um, of metastatic disease. Yes. Uh, and were any of those patients included in this, in this cohort that you presented? Sorry? Uh, were any of those patients included in this study? Yeah, some some patients uh, with uh, um, bones metastasis and those that I I presented as other organ uh, brain metastasis were included in that other organ. Um, oh, I see. Okay. So th did those you patients. Have any, did you have yeah. any side effects from from the recombinant human TSH treatment? No, no, no. Except for that, for those patients that uh, referred the cyanidinitis. We didn't have any side effects. But it seems at least uh, those patients, they did receive uh, uh, steroids during treatment. Is that correct? Some of them, okay. but not all. Okay. I see. I see. It's not, so, it's not that yeah. frequent. Okay. So, so Stephanie, um, what would be, and, and, and Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Gorkin is asking this question, what would be your, the, the practice and, and memorial in, in preparation of patients with distant uh, differentiated type of cancers for radioactive iodine? I, I, I would say that, um, particularly with the 
you know, I, I know that you see many of patients with metastatic disease. One would be the typical patients with pulmonary metastatic disease, and the other ones, the ones we were just talking with Joanna, what, what happens with those individuals who had perhaps a difficult location of this disease? Yeah. So I will say, in general, um, at Memorial, all of our radioactive iodine is given with recombinant human TSH preparation. So we don't have any protocols that include thyroid hormone withdrawal at this point. So we, um, but what I would, you know, when we do have patients with spinal mets or brain mets, um, things like that, we generally will try to treat those metastatic lesions first um, with radiation, ablation, or things like that, and try to address those metastatic locations first and delay the radioactive iodine until after that treatment is complete and then and then do the radioactive iodine when we've already tried to um, destroy the active cancer cells like in the spine. We'll generally radi do radiation to the spine, typically, you know, radiation to sometimes surgery to a brain metastases, and then um, delay the radioactive iodine until those more um, concerning lesions have been um, have been treated. Mm -hmm. And I know that Memorial, you do for many cases uh, lesion dosimetry. And have you, well, um, I'm not quite sure you can compare this with before you were using um, a recombinant TSH, but I'm trying to get to the idea whether uh, there is more uptake in those patients that went through withdrawal rather than recombinants. You know, there have been some suggestions that for metastatic disease, uh, recombinant might not be as effective as withdrawal. So have you had any insights since uh, Memorial is one of the only places that uh, do lesion dosimetry? You know, I, I mean, I think, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer in that I don't have I don't have the data on memorial patients who went through thyroid hormone withdrawal and potentially had the endosymmetry. I don't know that we ever have done lesional dosimetry after thyroid hormone withdrawal to have something to compare mm, yeah. it to. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think you know. So for that's the the thing that that's one of the things that we've really sort of moved towards is this idea of I-124 PET and doing this lesional dosimetry, which is a big part. We, we, we're doing it with our redifferentiation re therapy, and we're actually starting to do it some with our more, more advanced patients just getting routine radioactive iodine. The idea being that you can sometimes get a very nice post-treatment scan where it looks like all these lesions have taken up radioactive iodine, but if they actually haven't taken up and a therapeutic dose of radioactive iodine, it makes a pretty picture, but it doesn't have that therapeutic effect. And so with lesional dosimetry, you can actually measure the amount of radioactive iodine being taken up by each of each lesion, each lung nodule, each bone metastasis, and then you can calculate how much of a dose is necessary to really provide a therapeutic dose to that mm -hmm. each, each metastatic lesion. And by doing that, we can then calculate sort of what we can see what the maximum tolerated dose is, and at that dose, how much how much of that disease would we be treating, and and would it be would it be um, beneficial from a therapeutic standpoint? So that's that is what we're sort of that's that's sort of I think the, what we're working towards, and and sort of our newer technology that we're using. We don't use it for anyone. It's not everyone. It's not necessary for everyone. But in 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 this population, like we're talking about today with this distant metastatic disease, I think it can be very helpful to avoid over-treatment when it's not going to be effective and then to provide, act, you know, to make sure that the treatment that you're giving is definitely therapeutic. Yes, that, that, that makes sense. And uh, one question from the audience, um, Joanna, is, is whether, you, whether in, in, in your institution you do, for these patients, for other patients perhaps, uh, you do molecular profiles uh, to patients with metastatic disease? Um, in this period of time that was included in this study, no. Okay. Now we are performing to some patients with poorly differentiated, most, mostly with those with advanced stages of disease and poorly differentiated, and obviously to anaplastic thyroid cancer to, to search for BRAF. Uh, mutations and other uh, fusions, and uh, but not for these patients, these differentiated thyroid cancer patients with advanced disease, it's not a routine 
in our center. Yes, so and no, no, thank you for that. Um, jo Joanna, one question is, uh, you presented, uh, I think, two important results. One in regards to the to whether or not it was uptake, and the other one in regards to uh, oncologic outcomes, uh, so, uh, progression and, and survival. Uh, were any of those outcomes uh, adjusted based on age or any other baseline characteristics? So, um, where, for instance, patients who were in the withdrawal uh, therapy, different in other variables, uh, although might not be different in the baseline, but were different in any other ways that you could have adjusted to see the results were different? Well, we, we tried to do that study, but there was no difference, so we just didn't present that. It was all similar between the, 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 the two groups, so um, that's why I did not present. Okay, so the adjustment was done, but again, during the univariant and multivariable analysis, there was no different. With, no, with the, not different, okay. so. Very good, thank you for that. Uh, another question for the audience is, the, is there any difference in radioactive iron clearance between thyroid hormone withdrawal or recombinant TSH? Uh, do you know that, Stephanie? If there is any difference in the, in the, um, in the clearance time? I believe there is, there is. The yeah. clearance is slower in patients who have been withdrawn from thyroid hormone. Um, because in the hypothyroid state, the um, metabolism is slowed down and they, the radioactive iodine is cleared more quickly in, in patients prepared with um, recombinant human TSH. Mm -hmm. uh, John, I think you, have, you wanted to say something too, or? No, I was just saying that the, the, the reports that focus on that theme, they say that the, clear, the renal clearance is lower in the hypothyroid state and that's why um, the radiodine uh, half time is prolonged in the the, the, the hypothyroidism um, uh, aided therapy. Yep. Um, a comment from the from the audience, and, and this is from Dr. Rhoda Cobin from Mount Sinai, says that before the availability of recombinant TSH. They actually did lesion a specific uptake and dosimetry to calculate uptake and, and, and dose, especially for pulmonary metastasis uh, with withdrawal. Um, it says that there's no prospective data on outcome and just retrospective, but it seems that they reduce the risk of pulmonary side effects. So, um, at least from the experience at, Mem at, at Mount Sinai and, and from Dr. Coven, it's, it's interesting that they did uh, do lesion dosimetry for withdrawal before, so it would be very interesting to to compare it uh, with uh, lesion dosimetry with recombinant TSH. So that's a very good comment. Um, thank you. Uh, from uh, another member of the audience uh, asked, are you doing diagnostic whole body scans in patients with metastatic disease uh, before doing radioactive iodine? That's, uh, I guess, for Stephanie. For me, yes, we, we do do diagnostic scans prior to treatment. Yeah. And um, one more the more philosophical question here for, for both of you is that um, we have in guidelines, and I, I was able to see that in your paper, Joanna, this threshold of TSH of 30. And the reason why I bring this question is that I know many places around the world that uh, we draw patients because they might not have recombinant TSH, for instance. And they, they go in a very lengthy protocol sometimes to achieve that threshold of uh, TSH above 30. And um, I do struggle with actually finding evidence supporting the 30, the 30 threshold. Um, are you aware of uh, you know, any, any studies that indeed shows that 30 is better than 20 or 25? Uh, because I, 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 that will have actual implications uh, for the time of withdrawal and perhaps the symptoms that patients are exposed. I'm not sure if, uh, Joanna, you, have, you encountered any of this evidence during well, your... Yeah. I, I did compare the levels of, the, of TSH, right? The, the, oh, level, yes. the levels of TSH, they were similar in both groups. And mm -hmm. that is described in other, in other reports 
that um, also evaluated the outcomes between uh, the avatarxine withdrawal and aerotropin. But um, I'm, I'm not sure if there is any real difference between 25 or 30 in terms of TSH. I did not see any, any study on that, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, have you have you encountered any 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 good explanations for the thirty? Um, uh, I don't, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure where that th that thirty cutoff um, came from or uh, how it was developed. I'm not, I'm sorry. But yeah, if anybody in the audience <laughs> and knows that, let us know. Uh, we um, actually, I was I was trying to find that evidence. Um, I was able to find one report uh, decades ago of seven patients. And that uh, used a threshold of 30, but uh, other than that, I, I was struggling to find that. Um, I do have a, another question, Joanna, for you. Is it seems that the, the timing for the first radioactive iodine dose was similar in both groups. Um, were any other radioactive iodine treatments given after the first one? And were those treatments similar also across among the two groups? So there was more treatment than this one for for patients in this cohort? Sorry, can you repeat? I didn't understand. Yes, yeah, so then uh, I think you you assess um you assess the timing for the first radioactive iodine dose in both in the both cohorts. And the timing I believe was similar, the timing from uh, from the first radioactive iodine dose. My question is were any other radioactive iodine treatment given after that? For these patients, uh, if I understand the question, you were asking if they received more than one therapy. Yes. Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. But some of them. Some of them. Yes. The median. Uh, the median number of radiodine therapies was 1.5 uh, in the levothyroxine withdrawal group and two in the thyrotropin group. Uh, so the majority, yes, received more than one therapy for their metastatic disease. And, and when they... Um, yeah. Go ahead, go yeah. ahead, sorry for that. No, I was saying that um, we do not perform uh, diagnostic, diagnostic uh, whole body synthesis. The, the chosen dose is, is empirically chosen. So it uh, between 100 and 150, so um, some of the of these patients, they most of them, they were submitted to 150 millicurie at each um, radio radio radiodyne therapy. And this was given. The subsequent treatments were given because they they showed response to initial treatment, or was part of the protocol. Some some institutions do have subsequent treatments. No, no, so, no. This was given because they they showed um, a previous uptake. Okay. Okay. It, and, it, and, it is not it is not our protocol to repeat, just uh, to repeat. No, just if if there is any clinical benefit, or if there is any uptake in the in the lesion. I see. So these subsequent treatments were also in line with the first treatment, meaning that if the first treatment was with withdrawal, subse subsequent treatments were also withdrawal? Yeah. yeah. I excluded those patients that were submitted to both. Like, the first one was uh, submitted by levothyroxine uh, draw, and the, the second one was submitted by a thyrotropin injection. These kind of patients were um, excluded from the analysis. I see. So the ones who switch, you, you exclude them. Okay, I see. You're trying to maintain the, the what you were saying, yeah. the homogeneous. Okay. And yeah. um, one thing is in, in the retrospective nature of your study, why some people uh, were treated with withdrawal versus other people were treated with, um, with a recombinant? Was that a Clinician-based decision, or was or, or was uh, something that was because the availability of recombinant uh, therapy? Why? What were people treated for one way and another way? Uh, 
it has been changing over the years. This, this encompasses a large period of time from two, 2006 and 2018. Uh, in the first years, most people were submitted to radiotherapy, um, radiotherapy therapy through uh, levothyroxine withdrawal. Now, most commonly, we prescribe uh, thyrotropin um, injection. Uh, but I think that one of the things that um, influences um, this higher number of patients with level of, um, thyrotropin um, preparation was that this group was also older than the, the levothyroxine withdrawal. Probably these patients could not be submitted to uh, clinical hypothyroidism. This is probably an explanation for that. But mm -hmm. it's mainly because we have been increasing, um, the availability has been increasing. And with that, we have been increasing the, um, the, this therapy uh, and yeah. been offering this therapy to, to the patient. Okay, a more convenient kind of a process. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stephanie, you, 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 you mentioned in your presentation about nine previous retrospective cohorts. Are those results or these results consistent with those other cohorts or are we seeing mixed signals? Yeah, no. Um, so that's this from the paper. So um, Dr. Sumoy's Pereira in the paper does kind of summarize eight additional studies that retrospective studies that looked at com um, comparing um, thyroid hormone withdrawal versus um, recombinant human TSH in the treatment of patients with metastatic disease. And really across the board in those studies, it was um, the two preparations were um, found to be equivalent. But so um, again, okay. This study was the largest, but they were all just small cohort study, retrospective cohort studies, um, but did not find any differences. No, perfect. Then that is good to know. Um, uh, Stephanie, um, there is one question from the audience uh, about what happens when patients receive amiodarone or they are exposed to IV contrast. Um, with iodine, what is the protocol and memorial for these patients? How long do you wait? Do you do iodine in the urine before going forward uh, with uh, radioactive ion therapy? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that we have a specific protocol at Memorial. Um, I think we each have our own individual approaches. I will say generally we will wait um, about three months after um, a CT scan with contrast before um, proceeding with radioactive iodine treatment. So, and if we do, with a three month wait period, um, we don't typically then measure the urinary iodine in that situation. If if someone has much more advanced disease, if there's some sort of an urgency, um, then, and maybe it hasn't been the full three months, then we will measure urine iodine to make sure that they've cleared the iodine and then move forward with the radioactive iodine. Um, with amiodarone, it's even more of a challenge that because the iodine does tend to stay in the fat tissue even longer. Um, I've had patients that we've had to wait over a year um, for iodine levels to normalize after, um, depends a little bit on how long they were on amiodarone. Um, there's not really a whole lot you can do to avoid it. You, you really just have to wait and, and minimize iodine exposure until it's out of the system, um, especially with the amiodarone, it, it's in the fat stores and you just it just has to clear. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you for that. And Gabby, Gabriela, can you put this slide from uh, Tyro? Um, um, I just wanted to let the audience know about our platform Tyro. So Tyro is, I wanted just to uh, tell you about this. I was part of the group who developed, and this is a platform that is um, actually the, the work from a multidisciplinary group of individuals, part of also the Tank Foundation. and. This is a way for clinicians to access the best recommendations for the management of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer uh, at your fingertips. So this is an application you download in your phone, you have a question or so you think about how it's going to be treated these patients with radioactive iodine. Withdrawal, for instance, with recombinant, with actually thyroid, that summarizes that recommendation, very easy to access. You can find references and you can find links to presentations like this. So I will I strongly suggest the audience to take a look at Tyro. You can go to the QR 
uh, their link and uh, start trying this. And I think you will find that it's a very useful experience for you and your patients. Um, um, Gabby, can you put the slide for next sessions? Uh, next week, we're going to have a special guest from China, uh, Dr. Shak Jawan. She's going to be presenting the management of thyroid cancer and thyroid hormone in China, which I think is a very interesting topic because of the differences in, in, in culture and context that makes some of the recommendations we have in the United States and in other countries different in, in, than in China. So um, I will um, invite all the audience to attend that session as well. And finally, again, to uh, really, really thank our speakers today, uh, Dr. Simone Spirreira and Dr. Fish. We really appreciate your time. Uh, were wonderful presentations and wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.